Hello, my name is Sherry Adams and I work with um, Southwestern District Health Unit and today we're going to talk a little bit about incident command and how that structure fits together with public health. So today we're going to talk about the three components of basic incident command which includes ICS 100 and 200 as well as the overall pro process of NIMS which is ICS 700. So this whole process of responding to disasters isn't new. And after 9-11, President Bush decided because of the way things happened back then and the way agencies were not able to communicate with each other, he put into play Homeland Security Presidential Directive Number 5. And this is how do all of us, no matter if you're law, fire, EMS, public health, public works, how do we all come together in a disaster and work together and be on the same page. And so that's where these classes come into play. And it used to be re recommended, but they are now mandated. So any agency that participates in a response for disasters needs to take these classes. So these are FEMA classes that are encompassing all the United States. So these are national preparedness classes. And so you take it in North Dakota and it works just as well in California. Homeland Security Presidential um, Directive Number Eight is how we work together with our national, um, with the federal partners. So the goal is that no matter what level we're at, whether we're working at a local level, or a state level, or working with our federal partners, that this whole process comes together, and that we all have one way to communicate and direct these large disasters. So what exactly is NIMS? NIMS stands for National Incident Management System. And this is the overall premise that any agency, no matter what level or um, what agency you work for, can come together under this one management system and work together to respond to any type of disaster, whether it is very small or very large. It's a comprehensive national approach to incident management, which means Again, all levels, whether you're at this very low local level in a very small community or a very large city, they are all taking these classes to try to understand how to work together in any kind of disaster situation. This training is applicable across all jurisdictions. So it's relatively new to things as public health. Um, law enforcement, fire, EMS have always been considered first responders, but now public health also, and hospitals and clinics, and any of those other agencies are all considered, again, to be first responders needing this type of um, process. The hope with this is to improve coordination and cooperation among all response organizations. Even public and private industry are taking these courses. So with the increase of oil in North Dakota, all of the private industries, such as your um, big oil companies, also take these classes. And so that we, again, can partner together in whatever disaster may happen. It's an overall concept and principles for all threats. So it used to be mostly used by the fire service, but this is now becoming an all hazards approach. So for public health, this process would work very well in such things as a pandemic when we have to also have some kind of outbreak where we might need to vaccinate multiple um, people or hand out antibiotics. So it's the same kind of premise. And they use this for hurricanes, wildland fires, flooding, whatever the disaster might be. So you'll see on this slide the two actual plans that you can get um, and read them all the way through and that is the National Incident Management System um, plan as well as the National Response Framework. And the, again, these are the two ideas that the federal government put together on how we all will come together and respond to a disaster. So this is the overall premise of NIMS, and it is because it is very flexible. So this process works for a single car accident all the way up to a multi-state disaster. And the whole idea behind this is that it doesn't matter, a small amount of responders can come together, up to hundreds of responders, and the same process works. So this breakdown is of what the different components of NIMS are. 
NIMS is, is broken down into Incident Command, Resource Management, Communications, and Management. Now, the Incident Command system itself is um, just one component of overall NIMS, and we're going to talk a lot more about the different components of that in a few slides. But we also need to figure out a coordinated a way to handle resources, as well as a way to come together and be able to communicate and get that information sharing. And those are also big challenges that have happened in the past. But with this process, the hope is that using this management system and using communications across all jurisdictions will make the, the disaster not as bad as it could have been. All right, we're going to start talking a little bit more about the whole incident command system process. There's basic features across the board for incident command. And one of the things that is really important is common terminology. We try to use our day-to-day -day language. So this is where we don't use 10 codes or any kind of code situations because we want all agencies to be able to communicate with each other. So we just use our day-to-day -day language. We also have specific resources and facility titles that we're going to use. And we'll, there's slides that will go into more detail about all of these features. We're also going to talk about what a manageable span of control is. How can we manage the number of people that might respond? And there's different ways to do that, different ways to break out the different groups to be able to manage them. We're going to get rid of our day-to-day -day titles and use a consistent model of titles across the board. So we don't no longer use such terms as captain or administrator. We will use things as incident commander and operations chief. We're going to rely on what's called an incident action plan. This is kind of taking us back to grade school where we had to write who, what, when, where, why, and how. And that is the whole pro process of developing this plan so that we, again, are all on the same page. We're going to manage by objectives, and these are the key component as to what we want to accomplish in a certain time frame. Obviously, one of the big issues and big things is communications. So how can we integrate communications amongst all the jurisdictions? Public health doesn't usually have radios that are at our access. And so how do we, as public health, communicate with law enforcement and fire and EMS? So we have to have a process to do that. And so that's one of the features of incident command is bringing that um, ability into play. And one of the biggest things is accountability. And this is for you as responders that would participate. We have to have a way that we can manage people and make a way that we are checking them in, checking them out, making sure they know what to do. And so this is the whole promise, uh, uh, premise of this accountability. So we're going to talk a little bit more detail about all of these different components of the incident command system. So this is the key component to what's called the incident command system. So command is the process. These are the people actually that are responding to the incident. So there's two components to this whole process. Command, which is this process of directing, ordering, controlling, and, and handling the entire situation. The other part of this is coordination. And this is the support agencies that we'll talk about again in the next few slides. So you have command and you have coordination. This is the basic incident command chart. I use the acronym CFLOP to help remember the different components. The C stands for command, which is the top section of this chart. And that consists of the incident commander, liaison officer, safety officer, and public information officer. Underneath that is the general or sections um, group. These are the FLOP group. They are not a FLOP, it's just an easy way to remember the different naming. And that stands for finance, logistics, operations, and planning. So this is the basic chart. These positions will never change no matter what the incident is. You may have some of them in play or you may have all of them in play depending on the size of the disaster. You will also see here there's different color coding. And some agencies will use a color coding system with vests and that will help to identify the different positions. So everybody in operations would wear red, Everybody in finance would wear green and so forth. We also do what's called an orderly chain of command, and that is just um, going up the ladder and down the ladder for discussion. Logistics needs something or they need to put a report in. They will go to the incident commander. Incident commander may talk to operations. Operations may talk back to incident commander. So it goes up the ladder, down the ladder. 
It doesn't mean you can't talk to each other across the board, but if you have any kind of formal requests or such, that needs to go in this orderly chain of command process. This is a really important slide as well. So if you take the, one, the slide last, which is the basic incident command chart, and you take this slide, this slide is the terminology for the position titles. So no matter what incident there is, the person in charge is going to be the incident commander. The incident commander can have a deputy, and a deputy works in the same kind of capacity as, say, for example, a deputy, deputy sheriff. They should be just as qualified to handle the situation. Your command staff are all named officers, and that's that safety officer, liaison officer, and public information officer. They are the command staff. They all have assistants that can help them. These individuals are people that are the right arm to these people, writing down all the notes, helping them with all the um, tracking. It's a very important position. You go down to the general staff or the sections. Again, this is the flop group, and they are all called chiefs. They can also have a deputy. We're going to talk more about the other positions as they are all um, different breakouts underneath the finance, logistics, operations, and planning. So when you look at this format, in every situation, you're going to have an incident commander. That is the person in charge. You'll have various command staff. You'll have various general staff. And for that manageable span of control, we'll break it down into branches, divisions, groups, units, strike teams, and task force. This slide shows the different nomenclature for incident facilities. As you recall, we try to use the common terms and that comes into play also with facilities. The incident command post is the location where the incident commander carries out the functions of responding to the incident. This incident command post can be a big building, it can be a tent, it can even be the back of a pickup truck. A staging area is where individuals and resources have been given an assignment and they are ready to go out and respond to the objectives of that operational period. A base is a location where things are out of service. So these are things that may need to be refueled, maybe they need to be fixed, it may be people that need to sleep. So they are out of service for a certain time frame. Camps are used a lot in the Forest Service, and these are facilities or locations that are put out strategically so that responders can come in and get sleep and fed and respite during a certain time frame as well. So these are the different incident facility terms for incident command. As was discussed in the previous slide, the staging area are for available resources. These are resources, whether they're people or equipment, that have been given an assignment and are ready to go out um, for that operational period. This slide shows that incident command works on a modular um, basis. So it's very flexible, it works in any size or complexity, any type of incident. So it can expand and contract based on the incident. And that is what's the wonderful thing about incident command. One of the other things that's wonderful about incident command is that there's really no hard and fast rules to remember. So you can set this process up based on whatever scenario is needed. You can fill all the positions, you can fill some of the positions, you can activate certain elements, you can um, adjust it however it's needed based on the incident. The only rule that is, uh, comes into play with incident command is that the incident commander and the staff underneath agree to the process. But there is no um, one set way of doing this. An example of no hard and fast rules is this, this slide here. So you see from the initial incident command chart that I showed you, this chart shows we've only activated the incident commander, a safety officer, operations section. We've actually only operate, activated the situation unit, which is part of planning, without activating the planning chief. So again, you can activate part of this chart, you can activate all of the chart depending on the scenario. And so that's what is so unique and interesting about incident command. It will work for any situation. After 9-11, they did add another section that can be used in an incident command chart. And that's the information and intelligence section. This is the only part of incident command that can actually shift around in the incident command chart. It can be part of the command section where it becomes an officer. 
It can be under operations as part of a branch. It can be part of planning as the intelligent, um, as a unit. Or it can be part of the actual flop group and become the flop eye group and become a chief. This is the only one that can be moved around based on where it might be needed. This is a component that is used for things such as terrorism, anything that has to do with the criminal aspect. And so this is very important um, component that can be added. One of the ways that incident command works is that we use a process called unity of command. That is the process where you report to one supervisor. And again, using that up the ladder, down the ladder mindset. We all have to report to someone in this chart. And that is to make sure that everybody is safe, they have their assignment, and everybody is accountable. So we use the process of unity of command, reporting to one supervisor, getting your assignments from one supervisor. It should not be confused with unified command which is where several agencies come together as a command and function to um, respond to that disaster. So you will see this terminology in different locations and that's called unity of command. Unified command is a function that is used a lot, especially in rural North Dakota. And that's where more than one responding agency will come together to respond to a disaster. You have a, a car accident when you'll often see fire, law and EMS all responding. They all come together as a unified command to respond to that situation. And it does not have any of the different features of incident command. The only difference would be you may have more than one incident commander, but they are still all under the same process. Another type of um, handling a disaster is what's called an area command. This may be used in public health. For example, you have an outbreak of some kind and all the, res all the counties or all the public health entities all may need the same resources. And so you might establish what's called an area command where they come together and they try to figure out who needs what based on the priorities. The, this area command will set the strategies and the priorities based on life safety, incident stability and preservation of property. You'll hear me talk a lot about that in, in, throughout this presentation. This area command also comes together and decides who gets what resources based on, again, life safety, incident stability, and preservation of property. We want to make sure that the, the objectives are met and each strategy is followed. And so you'll have an, an overall command process and the other operations sections might be in outlying counties, they may be in different cities, and so you do this that are still close enough together. Um, we use this process in, in like um, the Southwest region because we're a district health unit. And so the main command center would be in Dickinson and our other command processes would be in our outlying counties. And they would reach out to the main office and say they need these resources. We've seen this process also at the state level when there's flooding in multiple counties where all the different counties report to the state and they say they need the same resources. And so the state will do a very similar area command and decide who gets what resources based again on life safety, incident stability and preservation of property. In order for incident command to work, we have to have formal communication. And again, this goes on the premise of chain of command and up the ladder, down the ladder. We must receive our assignments, request resources, and report our assigned tasks and the progress of those tasks in this formal manner. You can have informal communication as well, but formal process must take place in order for this uh, incident to be handled in a proper manner. So informal communication can also take place. So we are not little robots out there and, and can only talk to certain people up the ladder. We also can talk to each other to get different information. But in the event that we need to request resources or get our assignments, it has to be in this formal manner. And that's for accountability and making sure that everybody is safe. Informal communication doesn't really affect the incident. You may have logistics talking to planning or planning talking to finance, but if you need that actual resource or some resource to happen, it has to go up the ladder in a formal process. 
The next few slides, we're going to talk about more detail the different roles in, of the different um, positions in Incident Command. So the very first one we're going to talk about is the person that will be in charge. In an incident command process, the very first person on scene is considered the incident commander. That person stays incident commander until they turn command over to somebody more qualified or the scene changes or whatever the situation may be. But the incident commander is that person that will be in charge. In a unified command, you may have two or three incident commanders, but there is always going to be one that is going to be the lead incident commander. We all know people that would make good incident commanders. These are people that are good delegators. They have to trust the people that are underneath them to carry out the different functions. We also know that they need to be level-headed, that they must be able to do many tasks at once. They are going to be responsible for all of the activities, all of the functions, and they will be the ones that initially establish those objectives. What do we need to happen during this time frame? They are going to be the people in charge. So the incident commander initially when an incident happens are going to, is going to determine what positions to fill. So they may fill all of the positions, they may fill just a few positions. Under the incident commander you're going to have the command staff and these are the different um, officers that we talked about previously and we'll talk a lot more detail about all of these in the next few slides. But the command staff consists of the public information officer, liaison officer, and safety officer. The main role of the safety officer is to make sure that the safety of all of the personnel responding is being taken care of. They will look at making sure the scene is safe, making sure that the responders all have the right personal protective equipment. So they are going to look at the overall scene, the overall incident, and advise the incident commander on that safety for the responders. The liaison officer is the point of contact for other agencies. So they would be that representative that can respond to the incident commander and base that communication on what the agency might need. So they can also provide briefings and answers to those agencies. And so they act as that um, communication between an agency and going to the incident commander. A very important part of Incident Command is making sure that the right message gets out in a timely manner. And part of that role is with the Public Information Officer. They are the ones that will coordinate with the media, they will help with the talking points. They are not necessarily the spokesperson, but they are the ones that control the messaging. The messaging does, however, have to be approved by Incident Command. And so that message will be written, Incident Command has to sign off on it, or they will establish a briefing and coordinate the media. This position is very important, especially nowadays with all of the social media aspects and, and how that affects the disasters. So again, we've talked a little bit about the command staff. We're going to now go into the general staff or the sections. And again, these this is commonly uh, referred to as the flop group, and they are managed by chiefs. The operations section is usually the largest section in a disaster because they are the people that will be putting out the fires, taking down the perpetrator, giving out the vaccinations. So this is the largest section. This is the only section in the incident command chart that will change as to what is underneath it. And I'll talk more about that as we go forward. These are the ones that have to carry out the strategies and the tactics based on the objectives. So the incident commander establishes the objectives. Operations section will come up with strategies and tactics to carry out those objectives. From that, they will decide what resources they're going to need. And then that process will go through the process of ordering and all of that. So I call this section the doers. So this section is usually the first to be um, activated. So you have the first person on incident commander and obviously the first people then that are going to respond will be operations. They usually expand from the bottom to the top. So what does that mean? So initially you might have a rescue group that shows up, but this situation might start growing. And so maybe you do decide then, well, we probably do need an operations chief on top of that. So again, it can expand and contract based on the situation. Obviously, this will be the largest group. 
that will respond to a disaster. So one way to handle what we call span of control. So in a situation, you only want to handle so many people. Basically, that was three to seven. They are kind of changing that mindset that maybe you can handle a few more than seven people if the disaster is not very high stress. But whatever the premise may be, there's different ways to handle that span of control. And under operations, and again, this is the only section that can divide it into these different things, um, you can have very different um, examples. For example, divisions. Divisions are divided geographically. So under operations, you could have the East a Fire Division. You could have the West Fire Division based on what the need is. You may also divide it into groups. Groups are functional. And those would be like the perimeter control group, the vaccination group. It has a specific function. Or you can have branches. And branches can be either geographical or functional. So you could just have a basic thing such as a law branch, a fire branch, a public health branch. And so under operations, these are the only things that may be added or changed. Under logistics and finance and planning, you have specific units or um, sections that are already pre-established. Only under operations do you add and subtract these different types of things to handle span of control. Um, many of the, the different types of incident command systems I've seen out there use a lot of branches and use a lot of groups. So there are other ways to handle um, span of control under operations. And again, this, this component or these components here are just for operations. So you may put together what's called a task force. A task force is what is seen in, in picture C. That is a mixture of different entities coming together. You may have a law person, a fire person, an EMS person, a public works person coming together and being assigned a specific task. You may have what's called a strike team, which I think um, FEMA is changing that to a resource team, but those are like components. That would be like you would see in the picture A. Three fire trucks going out for a specific mission to strike and take care of that. Or you may have what's called a single resource. This could be an environmental health specialist. This could be a hazmat technician. This could be a meteorologist. This is a single resource going out or being activated for a single purpose. And that would be like picture B. So if you think about the big picture, under operations, it can be divided into branches. It can be divided into groups, division, task force, strike teams, and single resources. Whatever may happen under, under operations, this is the only group this, where this changes and this terminology changes. The naming of task force, strike team, single resource, divisions, group, and branches, that nomenclature stays the same. What does change is the types that are under there. For example, you may not always have a fire branch. You may not always have a strike team. It's going to based, be based on what the disaster is and what you need. The next section we'll talk about is planning. The planning section chief, they are the ones that are going to gather and analyze and get all the information out. They are going to be the ones that will put together what's called an incident action plan. During a disaster, you usually have what are called operational periods. In most disasters, that operational period is like a 12-hour shift. And during each of those operational periods, that's where the incident commander comes up with the objectives. That's where operations comes up with strategies and tactics. And this is where the planning section will compile what's called the incident action plan. What needs to be accomplished during that next 12 hours? The planning section is the group that will coordinate all of the different materials, all the different forms, and put it together for one plan and bring that to the different meetings that happen throughout that operational period. I call the planning section the what ifers because they are the individuals that are always thinking what if. What if the weather changes? What if the road closes? They are going to be the ones monitoring the situation. They're going to be the ones documenting all of the things, writing the incident action plan, and preparing what's called the demobilization plan. They are the ones that are going to be always thinking about, do we have the right resources? Do we need to get in more resources? And planning for that next operational period.
You will see under the planning section there are four set units, resource unit, situation unit, demobilization unit, and documentation unit. You may actually have people running those units or you can have the planning section chief be in charge of all of them or part of them, so depending on what you need. What doesn't change under this is the nomenclature for these four units. As you remember in the past slides, operations is the only one that can change what's underneath them. So in this particular section, resources are going to be monitoring the resources, situations, monitoring the situation, demobilizations, going to be thinking about getting rid of resources that are not needed anymore, and documentation is very important, making sure all of the forms and all of the things that are being documented are being kept. The next section is logistics. Logistics are the people that get everything you need based on the requests. Um, I always liken this to Radar O'Reilly of MASH, the old TV show MASH, where he could get anything you needed, um, any, any, any process that was there, he could find it. So this is the logistics section. So if planning is the what-ifers and operations are the doers, logistics are the go-getters. So these are the people that are going to be responsible for all of the support and service needs of the incident. So, as with planning, these are set um, positions under logistics. So you have the service branch, and under the service branch, this takes care of all the needs of the responders. So they have to set up a communications plan, which is how can the responders talk to each other. A medical unit, which is how um, would the responders be taken care of if they got injured. And probably the most important group, the food unit, making sure everybody is fed. And so under the service branch are all the things that try to fit the needs of the responders. On the other side of that is the support branch. And these are for everything else. These are for supplies, for facilities, for ground, everything else that you might need to be able to support the incident. Now again, if you do not fill the positions underneath with actual people, the logistics chief would be responsible for filling those roles. So you may have a logistics chief in a, in a very small incident that's also taking care of food, figuring out a communications plan, figuring out um, the medical unit. But in a very large incident, you're most likely going to divide this into all these different units um, to make sure that everybody is taken care of. Again, the medical unit is part of logistics, and this is a medical plan. So what this is is that there has to be a process in place in case a responder gets hurt. It may be an ambulance that is prepositioned in a specific location. For public health, we often do a mass vaccination clinic, and inside our mass vaccination clinic, we have an area that if somebody got injured, it'd be like a first aid station. And so we want to make sure that any of the responders that get injured have a place to be taken care of prior to maybe having to ship them to a, a facility. The last section that we'll talk about is the finance and administration. This is a very important position, often not given the same level of respect as some of the other positions because they're kind of um, on the back scenes. But they are responsible for all of the financial part of an incident, all the costs. They also um, take care of all the contracts. They track the personnel, the timesheets. They also do workers' comp claims. They um, work very closely with logistics, making sure that everything is being um, tracked, costs are being paid. And so a very important role are, are the finance and admin people. So under finance, you also have units, the time unit, procurement unit, compensations and claim unit, and the cost unit. Again, if you do not have specific people, the finance chief will be in charge of all of those. So tracking time and all of the people, if you think a very large incident, just monitoring all the timesheets um, and making sure everybody is being able to be paid is a very large um, responsibility. Um, having contracts, making sure that what the um, operations section is needing to carry out the objectives can be paid for, making sure the right equipment is being handled and um, processed. Obviously, if anybody gets hurt, this is a very big situation that can happen, and you want to make sure that they are covered and tracking all the costs. So you might hear 
in different um, incidents or different disasters, this is costing 25 million, this is costing a billion dollars. That is all being tracked and monitored by the finance section. Okay, this slide tells us again, the first person arriving on scene is considered the incident commander. This will take place until a higher ranking person comes or maybe somebody that um, better fits what ha is happening out there. Or um, if it's a long-term situation, they just may need to have a different incident commander because of fatigue. An example of this is uh, you come on scene to a car accident. The law enforcement may be the incident commander. The, it may be then changed over to EMS based on the situation, maybe turned over to fire if they have to do extrication. So again, depending on the scenario will depend on again who's going to be incident commander. But the rule of thumb is the first person on is the incident commander until otherwise um, changed. So in very large incidents, you may want to have what's called the deputy incident commander. And deputy just means that. They are just as qualified to handle the situation as the incident commander. You will see this in very large incidents because the incident commander may need to go to different meetings or briefings, and then the deputy incident commander can fill in the role of us being on scene. There are also different personnel that are involved in the incident command process. And one of those is the agency representative. This is an individual that's actually assigned to that agency from, um, assigned to the incident from an assisting agency. And, and this makes a lot of sense because they will know their agency better than anybody else. And so sometimes you will hear of an agency representative also on scene. We see assisting agencies a lot in North Dakota under what's called memorandums of understanding. This would be where a local fire department will help another fire department or an ambulance will help another ambulance. They will be called on as mutual aid to assist in the incident. They still fall under the incident command chart, maybe part of the operations, but um, assisting agencies are utilized a lot um, on our day-to-day -day inc incidents. Cooperating agencies will also, can also be part of the incident command process. This may be an agency that will um, give different resources, but not actually send the personnel or be part of that actual on-scene response. For example, you see this a lot with during the flooding time when um, different agencies would hand over pumps. And so they were cooperating by giving different resources. The incident command process actually used the pumps, but the agency was one that was able to help out by cooperating and giving different resources. We also talked about the importance of having assistance. When you're in an incident and things are very hectic and you need to be documenting everything, this person or these persons are very important in the fact that they can be the ones writing down the information. They can be the ones trying to coordinate the documents. And so they have a very important role. You don't actually see them on the incident command chart as a specific position, but they can be in a support role in the different um, sections under command. So I like this slide in the fact that it kind of shows you an overall picture of how an incident can expand and how you can add all those different components under operations. So you can add the branches, the divisions, the groups, the units, the single resources. And again, depending on how large the incident is, depending on what the incident is, will determine what these different positions are filled. And so that's what's so exciting about incident command. You can have a very small, um, incident command chart, or as you think about a very large incident, it can expand um, and utilize all of these different components. A part of the whole incident command process is the documentation, and this is extremely important, especially if you're going to get any kind of reimbursement from the federal government. And part of that process, there is a whole set of forms. There's lots of different forms that are out there. And the upper level incident command classes, you learned all the different forms and how to use these forms. Other things that are in the incident command toolbox are your operations plans, any types of policies and procedures, maps, anything that can help with an incident and make it um, easier and more um, able to be handled. 
The next few slides are going to um, talk a little bit more about the complexity and, and how to handle larger incidents. Obviously, the more complex the situation, the bigger uh, your incident command chart will be, the more resources you're going to need, the more people you're going to need. And so there's different factors that may, can make an incident more complicated. Obviously, anytime there's an impact to life, that escalates an incident right away. Um, are there um, issues with responder safety? If you think about a hazardous material incident where there's chemical plume or such, uh, that can be um, more complicated, especially with the different types of weather that we see in North Dakota. Um, weather is a very large factor in making the complexity of an incident. If you think about um, trying to respond to an incident at 40 below zero with snow flying in your face, and that can obviously make the incident more complicated. Anytime there's a likelihood of us cascading events, if you think about Katrina and how it initially hit Louisiana and how that event became even more complicated after the levees broke. So again, any type of incident that starts very small and maybe goes into a very longer situation can make it more complicated. Anytime there's any kind of potential crime scene, if you think about the Boston City Marathon and how that was an incident initially, an event that became an incident and then became even more complicated, adding that it was a terrorist event. Anytime you have any kind of political sensitivity, anything that has to deal with the media, any of those things that make an incident more complicated um, and goes on for days and days, it can make this situation even more complex. Anytime you have an incident that goes over multiple jurisdictions, involves multiple agencies, goes across state lines, even goes across international lines because we do border Canada. Obviously, the other part of making an incident more complicated is, do we have the right resources? Do we have what we need? Um, this was a challenge sometimes with um, when you have multiple states needing the same resources. So all of these factors coming into play can make an incident obviously more complex. Another way to look at it is this slide showing the very top one saying that is a very complex incident, obviously needing lots of resources. Obviously, the incident command chart is going to fill all of the different positions. Whereas you have a smaller incident, not nearly as complex, doesn't need nearly the resources. We're going to talk just a minute about um, a process in resource management, and that is determining the different kinds and types of resources. If you think of a very large incident and all of the resources that need to come in and all the different components and all the different agencies, you do really need to have very detailed information as to what kind of resource you would like. So there are kinds of resources and there are types of resources. Types of resources are a lot more detailed. Um, for example, if I said I need a nurse, that's a kind of resource. If I say, what kind of nurse, then that would be RN, CNA, nurse practitioner. Um, that is more of a type. So you have to be really specific in when you're ordering resources. This is really important also that you have different, um, if you have lots of agencies that are responding, you have different representatives from the different agencies helping out with resource ordering. What do I mean by that? For example, I would not be a good person to understand what kind of fire truck to order, but I'd be pretty good at ordering different types of syringes. So the pro process with all this is making sure, one, you have more detail, and two, you have the right people in that um, logistics section to be able to order the correct resources. So this is a picture kind of depicting the difference between kinds and types. So in A, um, that is more specific details about those types of equipment. So that is more of a type. And in picture B, those are different kinds. Now, if you had three different law enforcement people that were much more detailed, perhaps a bomb person, a pervert, you know, the different types that are there, that would make them more types. They're more detailed that are there. 
So this is really important because if you ordered a hazmat team and you weren't very detailed, in this picture on um, the what you needed under that on top of that picture, that's a level A hazardous material team. They could handle any kind of hazmat incident. On the other side, what you got was more of a lower scale biological type um, hazardous material team. So definitely you want to have the more detail in your ordering because if you don't, you may not get what you need. Another part of resource ordering and resource management is resource typing based on its capability. Um, a type one piece of equipment is much more complex, so it has more capability. It's at a higher level than a type four. So again, the type one is much more detailed. That would be like a nurse practitioner, and then a type four would be like a CNA. Along with typing resources, they also type the incident and the complexity. So the easiest way I remember this is that the more complicated hurricane and the more complicated tornadoes are category five. Well, in FEMA, it's the opposite. <laughs> so the more complicated incident is a type one. So type five incidents are those very minor little incidents that don't take a lot of resources. Whereas a type one incident would be like a category four or five hurricane. So again, just the opposite of what the complexity is of some of our um, natural disaster storms. Um, but the more complicated incident is a type one. What are incidents of national significance? You might often hear on TV that um, this state or that state has been declared a federal disaster. That's all based on this premise of incidents of national significance. So all incidents start local and once local resources are used, they may go to those county to county or mutual aid. Once those resources are used, the, the local emergency management personnel might declare a, a local disaster. You've probably heard about that in North Dakota based on droughts, based on floods and different counties have declared disasters. Once that declaration has happened, it goes to the state. If it's affecting the entire state, the state may then declare a disaster. This is based on we've utilized all of our resources in North Dakota. We may now go and ask for help from Minnesota or South Dakota or Montana. Um, but once those resources, we may then declare a, a federal disaster. And that's where it goes up to the president. Some of these situations obviously would be any terrorist threat. Any terrorist threat obviously brings that right up to an incident of a national significance, obviously bringing that up to a type one or two incident. Anything that has to do with um, multiple casualties, a plane crash, for example, um, again, the hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, any of those kinds of things can become incidents of national significance. And any time you have done those declarations, it escalates that up the ladder. The last few slides are going to talk about different other components just of the basic incident command process. And one of those is transfer of command. So any time an incident changes from, let's say, for example, a fire to a law to public health, there is um, a transfer of command. So that is the process of moving from one incident commander to the next. We have to document this, and usually they use that form 201 to document who's in charge. You may also transfer command. Obviously, if one commander's worked a 14-hour shift, they will transfer command to the oncoming incident commander. Another time you may um, transfer command, again, is if the situation has changed. And so you might need to transfer command to a whole other um, agency. All agencies that respond to an incident must act only under their own authority. So as a public health agency, I can only do and, and respond within the scope of our authority and given the delegation of what authority has been given to us. So I can't go into a scene and just say to the people, well, I can um, be with this perimeter control group because I stayed at a Holiday Inn and I'm pretty sure I can use a gun. 
you can't use that kind of analogy. You have to really only work within your scope of authority and whatever authority has been delegated to you. All right, so the first person on scene we have talked about is the incident commander. That person, or um, obviously at that very point, is going to say these are the objectives. From that point, they're going to come up with strategies, figure out what resources, and establish that initial incident command chart. So think about a car accident. The law enforcement's the first person in. They're going to call into dispatch. The first thing is we need to stop traffic. We need to have an EMS person here. Um, we need fire for extrication. So that all happens very quickly. In a very large incident, obviously this is a more detailed planned scenario in the fact that you would actually fill out the incident action plan, come up with a set of resources, figure out your incident command chart. So it all comes into play um, initially, no matter what the size of the incident is. So the overall priorities, and this is uh, true for all levels, whether you're at the lowest level of local, all the way up to federal government, every objective is based on what I call the acronym LIP. Life safety of the responders first, then the people they're helping, incident stability, and preservation of property. All goals and objectives are based on these three, three priorities. So from those priorities, the incident commander will set their objectives. This needs to state what happens, what needs to be accomplished. From that, it goes to operations. They will come up with different strategies to try to carry out those objectives. From those strategies, they will choose a specific tactic to carry those strategies out. So this slide shows all the different mutual aid agreements, and this is what I talked about just a few slides ago. All, all disasters start local. Through the local jurisdictions, they have mutual aid contracts. Mutual aid contracts are um, partners to partners, like EMS to EMS, EMS to fire, public health to public health, public health to hospital. So you have these mutual aids uh, agreements that are in place where we help each other out. Neighbor helping neighbors, kind of that concept and, and premise in North Dakota. From that, there's also what's called the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. This is where states help states. We see that a lot, and even in North Dakota, where um, South Dakota or Minnesota or Montana have come in and helped us with various scenarios. You see, you've seen it recently with all the California fires where all the different states go in and help another state out. And then you have the, few, the federal government, which will also help. Then they help states, they help tribes, they help territories. And that's also all part of this overall national response plan. The last couple slides are all about briefing. So it's really important that everybody that is responding should have some kind of a briefing. In an initial briefing, it's going to be, here's the current situation, this is what we have out there, this is the work area, these are the safety um, hazards, this is what prote personal protective equipment you need. So again, it's that initial briefing. I liken it also to coming onto a shift where you get the information of what's been done, what is happening, what's gonna happen, what are the objectives. There are lots of other types of briefings that are out there. If you're going to deploy to another state or another county or another area, you may be given specific directions as to you need these vaccinations, this is what you should plan for with the elements, these are the equipment you should take, this is who you should report to. Um, also, no matter where you're at, if you're in state, out of state, whatever situation you respond to, you should be checking in to somewhere and getting an assignment. Then again, there's other briefing, briefings down the chain. So each staff needs a briefing field, the sections. So all of these, the, the biggest part of this whole um, slide is that everybody should be um, on the same page. Everybody should know the precautions. Everybody should know the objectives, whether you're the incident commander or the uh, food unit leader. The final thing is demobilization. So everybody that is involved needs to make sure before they leave that they have turned in all their paperwork, that they have, well, one, that they're supposed to leave, but that they've turned in their paperwork, 
that they've um, touched base with their supervisors. Do they have a plan for um, leaving and what is the plan that is in place? Demobilization is very, very important. The other component that is very important, I think, in demobilization from any incident is making sure that there is a mental health debriefing. And that component is very important, whether it's a piece of paper saying if you see any of these signs or symptoms based on what um, happened at the incident, here's some contact information. Or it may be um, just what do you feel went well with this incident? What do you feel could be improved? But demobilization is very, very important throughout the entire incident. So this is the last slide, and this shows the entire um, incident command chart with all the sections and groups in there. And it is the basic premise of all of incident command. The last slide I will show you is how to register for what's called a FEMA student ID number and then where you can go to take the online classes to get certified. All right, the way to get certified is first you will have to go on to FEMA student ID number, and this is the website. If it doesn't work, then just Google FEMA student ID number. They will give you a number. Keep that number, make a copy of it, put it in your phone, because that number you'll need for any of the online uh, FEMA classes. Then, once you get that number, you can go on to the FEMA Independent Study Courses. These courses are free, and this was an overview of ICS 700, 100, and 200. So if you go into the training catalog, and again, if that website doesn't click right for you, just Google FEMA Independent Study Courses, scroll down to the ICS 700 and the ICS 100 and 200. That's kind of what this overview was. You can also take the online course and hear it um, individually. Each course is a little bit longer. And then you can click underneath there and it says take exam. Um, once you take the exam, and if you pass, uh, and you can take it as many times as you want to, there's no penalty, but you will um, get a certificate. And then keep that certificate because that transfers across every state and that also um, helps you when you're applying for jobs because you can say I've already taken these incident command courses. So um, there's also my contact information if you have any questions as you're going into this process. I hope this um, training has been beneficial for you. Um, any field that you go into, whether it's public health or health and medical or in general, um, and you have the ability to assist in any kind of disaster, this will definitely be a tool to be used to help you mold into their incident command process. And this um, also gives you the ability to understand how it is to respond in a coordinated fashion, no matter where you're at. In summary, the National Incident Management System, NIMS, improves coordination and cooperation among all threat response organizations. Incident Command provides a process of directing, ordering, or controlling by virtue of explicit statutory, regulatory, or delegated authority. The Incident Command System consists of the Incident Commander, Command Staff, and the General Staff that includes Logistics, Operations, Finance, and planning sections. Incident objectives are based on three priorities, life-saving, incident stabilization, and property preservation.